Good morning. I want to speak to you for a few moments about how to live in a crooked and perverse world. Now, my sermon this morning comes from the fact that I am a uh, student of the Bible. That is to say that the scriptures uh, shape how I think and how I live. But I am also an, an observer and a participant uh, in the culture in which we live today in America. The America that I grew up, the um, innocence and wholesomeness of Ozzie and Harriet and Father Knows Best and What's My Line is long gone. And as Franklin Graham has put it, uh, the Cocker Spaniel on the front porch has been replaced by the pit bull from the backyard. Now, we live in what the Bible refers to as a crooked and perverse generation. It is certainly a country that I do not recognize and I do not enjoy. It feels like Wanda said last week, like somebody close has died. Well, one early morning last week, and early morning for me is sometime between 4 and 4.30 in the morning, when our four-legged puppies decide that it's time for them to go outside and do their thing. And I get up and put on my robe and trudge outside and let them do their thing and then bring them back in, and they go right to sleep. They go in their crate or in, on their uh, bed, and I get back in bed, and my mind's working. I'm done. And I lay there and I edit my sermons or Bible study in my mind or I ruminate about uh, sermons to come. And in this particular uh, instance, I was ruminating about all the changes that had come to our country and how disturbing they are. And this is a time where God ordinarily speaks to me. And he led me to a uh, passage of scripture in Philippians chapter 2. And if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to open to Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to uh, think about uh, verses 1 through 18, but particularly verse 15. Now, before we get to the text, while you're turning there, I want to set uh, a biblical context, a foundation, if you will. In Genesis chapters 1 and 2, the Bible tells us that God created all that there is. Paul writes, I'm sorry, Paul, Moses writes, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then a few verses down later he says, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Well, there's another passage in Scripture that commends itself to me, and that's John's Gospel. John, the apostle, writes about creation using these words. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through him, so this word has a male pronoun, through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Now, both of these passages make some outstandingly profound statements of fact. And these facts and the ramifications uh, that flow from these facts set the context for all that I have to say this morning. The facts are these. God is the creator of all there is. Without his intentional act of creation, that means it didn't happen by a process of uh, uh, evolution, uh, anything else other than God's uh, intentional act. He spoke and all that exists comes into being. And without him, nothing that exists would be in, uh, in existence. And because he is the creator, and because this is his creation, 
He owns it. He has the absolute right, it's called a prerogative, but he has the absolute right to create the principles by which his creation works best. And that includes what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad. But God also created uh, or gave to his creatures, the humanity that he created, the right and the responsibility to make a choice, to live by his um, principles or to choose to go another way, to live according to their principles. Now, of course, there are consequences for our choices, but every human being has a choice to follow God or not follow God. So we see in Genesis chapter 3 that humanity in the person of Adam and Eve made a choice to disobey and rebel against God and follow the evil one, Satan. He had preceded them in making a choice to rebel against God and to disobey God. And so with their choice, sin and all of its chaos and evil came into God's perfect creation. And that is a fact that shapes all of human history from that point on, even to today. Now, God responded with two primary resources or provisions to rescue humanity because he loved humanity. He loves humanity from the consequences of their bad choice. The first is that he determined a plan of redemption. Now, from a human perspective, we could call this a long-term plan because it began back there uh, before he ever created the world. And none of this took God by, God by surprise. So he always had this plan of redemption, as did he the second thing that we're going to talk about here in a second. But from a hum human perspective, it was implemented uh, back in Genesis chapter 3, and it's still ap applicable uh, today in the 21st century. The second thing that he uh, created was authority, and he did that immediately. Authority, as God designed it and created it, is a neutral dynamic that is meant to counteract the chaos and the evil and the destructiveness that sin brings when it comes into the world. Authority is not better than or smarter than. It's neutral. It establishes order and responsibilities, and it's meant to create some level of peace and security. Remember that when sin entered the world, it didn't only modify or damage the relationship with uh, between God and humanity, it damaged the relationship uh, person to person, horizontally, vertically with God and horizontally with other human beings. And we therefore needed a means to create some level of peace and safety. And so God created for us authority. Now, the question arises at this point, what does this have to do with the current state of uh, America? Well, as we noted when we looked at Genesis, I mean, uh, Romans chapter 13, we talked about uh, governmental authority. And we said that uh, humans have done what humans do best. And that is that they have taken and distorted and perverted something that God meant for our good and they have made it evil, oppressive, and abusive. Humans have made authority all about power and control and domination. Their power and control, because humans seek power and control, and some humans seek ultimate power and control. What we see now in America is that if you disagree with popular culture, and Christ followers must disagree because popular culture 
is in open rebellion against God and his word. And so Christ followers must stand for the truth of God's word. But doing so yields us to be labeled as bigots and hate speakers. Now within the last year or two, if you disagree with leadership, you are censored. Opposition or alternative ideas are to be silenced. America has changed drastically and not for the better. So while I ruminate about this that early morning in the twilight <laughs> uh, hours of uh, before daylight, God brought me to this text in Philippians chapter 2, and I'd commend you to read verses 1 through 18, but we're going to start with verse 15. Listen as Paul writes in verse 15 of chapter 2. So that you may become blameless and pure children of God, without fault, in a crooked and depraved, and some translations use the word perverse, generation. It was that phrase, crooked and perverse generation, that grabbed my attention because it seemed like the Apostle Paul was reading my mind. That's exactly how I was feeling with all the changes that had come and the, the rigor uh, rhetoric that we see at the national level. Well, there's one more biblical truth that I want to set for you as a context. And that is, it comes from this crooked and perverse generation. That, that phrase has a history in scripture, as we'll see in a moment. But it's based on all that I have set forth. That God was, is the creator of all there is. And that this universe is his universe. And that the principles that govern God's universe are grounded in his nature. His love, his grace, his mercy, his kindness, his righteousness, his justice, and his holiness. The Bible uses a phrase that, that speaks of uh, God's nature being sort of like um, the transit that a, a, a surveyor would use to see that something is straight, a reed or a rod by which they used to measure in the ancient world. Or if you wanted to make sure that something was vertically, you use a plumb line to make sure that it's straight. So when the, the, uh, the, the Bible speaks of uh, a perverse and uh, crooked generation, it is referring to the fact that humans have distorted what God designed for our good and our safety and our peace. And that his nature is the measurement of what makes those qualities. And when his qualities are not uh, functional within a society, it becomes crooked, perverted. It's not right. So as I mulled over this passage and thought that this would be something that I should uh, bring to your attention or, or speak to you about because it was so troubling to me and I know uh, it's troubling to most anybody that thinks clearly and has been around long enough to know and see the changes that have come in our country. I came up with four questions. The first is, where are we as Christ followers now? Where? The second question is, who are we as Christ followers now. And then depending on your answers to those questions or either one, well, both of those questions, I have two more. What is to be our response to where we are and who we are? And how do we accomplish God's purposes for us in a corrupt and pagan culture? Well, this phrase, as I said, uh, corrupt and perverse generation comes the earliest point uh, I could find in Scripture, it may appear earlier, I don't think so, but deep in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 5. And God is using that phrase to describe his chosen people 
the Hebrews. That's how he described them. If you come, move through history to the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, he speaks of his generation as crooked and perverse. And he's speaking specifically in this passage uh, to those in authority in uh, the land of Israel. Listen to what he says. For your hands are stained with blood and your fingers with guilt. Your lips have spoken lies and your tongues mutter wicked things. No one calls for justice and no one pleads his case with integrity. They rely on empty arguments and speaking lies. Does that sound really familiar? Their deeds are evil, and acts of violence are in their hands. Their feet rush into sin. They are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are evil, and destruction marks their paths. The way of peace they do not know. They have turned them, their ways, into crooked paths. That's a horrible indictment of humanity. We'll move a little more uh, in history to the time that Jesus is walking here on earth and ministering to his own people, the Jews. In Matthew 17 and in, Ma in Luke 9, Jesus calls the Jewish people of his generation, his day, uh, with the same phrase, corrupt and perverse. He even used the word wicked. He called the religious leaders of his day in one specific, Matthew 23, if you want to check it, but uh, he's, he's talking to them, just them, not the crowd, just the religious leaders uh, of the Jewish people, and he calls them hypocrites. Sons of hell, blind fools. And these are the religious leaders of the children of Israel. So when Paul speaks of a people in the first century as being crooked and, and perverse, and then you look back throughout all of biblical history, you get the very clear understanding that humanity has always been like this even supposed religious uh, people or religious leaders. Where we are today in America is nothing new. That's my point. It has always been here. It is simply far more in the open in the U.S. than it has been in the last few decades. Oh, I listened to some of our political leaders as they wax eloquent with... Uh, uh, moral righteous indignation at the supposed sins of uh, their political opponents. And I think of the words of Isaiah uh, as being very applicable. You speak lies and your tongues mutter wicked things. So where we are today is a systematic destruction of God's moral principles. The principles that he gave us for life to be uh, lived well. Secondly, we're in a culture that denies or openly rejects God or his gospel. The gospel that transforms people and rescues them from the deception and the lies and the darkness of the evil one. And thirdly, we have substituted pagan human values for God's gospel, God's truth. And so you kind of wonder why we're lost. Verse uh, 19 of chapter 3, Paul says this of these people. They glory in their shame, and their destiny is destruction. In other words, they're proud of the evil that they do. They celebrate it. It's a pretty bleak but accurate uh, description of our country today. So this is the, country, the culture in which we find ourselves, a totally pagan and ungodly culture. This is where we are. 
Well, that's pretty bleak. But there is hope from God's perspective. And it's what I love about God's word. No matter what problem you're facing, there is some sort of solution or hope that God has for his children. And it brought me to Jesus' prayer in John's gospel, chapter 17. It's called Jesus' priestly prayer. He's moving from the upper room where he celebrated Passover down across uh, in front of the temple and down uh, over to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he stops. He's with the 11. Judas is off doing his thing. And they're going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane and pray. And that's where he's going to be arrested. But he stops. And he prays. All of chapter 17 is Jesus' prayer to his father before he's arrested. Now, I can't tell you how many sermons I could get out of that chapter. But I'm only going to read to you uh, a couple, three verses. Jesus is speaking to God, his Father. Powerful time, right? He knows what's coming in just a matter of an hour, an hour and a half. He says, my prayer is not for them to be taken out of the world. He's speaking of his followers then and now. He's identified two groups of followers, those that are with him uh, in that day and age and those like you and me that would come uh after that, but he's grouping them together. And he said, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. He says, sanctify them by the truth. Sanctify means to be set apart to God. So he's saying, sanctify them, his followers, you and me, by the truth. Your word, the scriptures, are truth. As you sent me, and here's the key phrase for us in our conversation this morning. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Remember, he started by saying, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world. So where are we now? We're living in a pagan, um, crooked, perverse world where people seek to do it they intend to do evil they speak lies and they celebrate their evil deeds but based on jesus's prayer that we just read we as his children as his his disciples we are right where jesus wants us to be he put us here he put us here to be witnesses to his gospel, to those who will listen the truth of God's word. They, some will make a choice to listen and others will make a choice to say not interested. God knows that. Our job is to share. So who are we to be? Our second question. That comes from that same verse chapter 15 of, excuse me, verse 15 of chapter 2. We are to be blameless and pure children of God. Now, it's kind of interesting that that term blameless, it really means without defect. And initially, it referred to the animals that the Jewish people would bring to the temple to, for sacrifice to cover their sins. In the New Testament age, it became a metaphor for disciples of Jesus that were engaged in that process of transformation that we've been talking about, renewing of our minds uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the instruction of the word of truth, God's Bible. This is God's will for his children to reflect and to portray his righteousness to the world around it, uh, to, to present the gospel, his gospel, to all who are willing to listen because he wants to draw those who will make the choice to come out of Satan's world of darkness and lies and deceptions and come into the glorious light of God's family, his kingdom. So who are we to be? Verse 15, we are those that shine like stars in the universe, Paul says, as we hold out the word of truth. The Bible is God's truth to humanity. 
We're right where Jesus wants us to be. He put us here to be shining lights, to share the truth of God's gospel. God's light dispels Satan's darkness. We'll drop down to verse 5 in chapter 2. I'm um, chapter, yeah, chapter 2, verse 5. I want to read for you what Paul says, those verses that flow from that, um, because he gives the people and us uh, another command. He says, your attitude should be, in other words, be like Jesus. Your attitude should be the same as Christ. Sounds like be like Jesus to me. And then he goes on to describe Jesus was God, and yet he humbled himself to do the purposes that God sent him uh, to earth to do. He became a servant of God to serve others, you and me. And he was obedient, Paul says, obedient even to death. So we are to respond to our crooked and perverse generation by being humble, obedient, servants of God, shining like stars as we hold forth the word of truth. Well, let me ask you that fourth question. How do we do all of this? And for those of you who know me, know that verse 13 of this chapter is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. Listen in verse 13, chapter 2. For it is God who works in you to will and then to do his, God's, good purposes. In other words, God, the Holy Spirit that lives in us, motivates us to will and then empowers us to be effective in doing what God has called us to do. So where are we? We're right where Jesus wants us to be, in a pagan, lost and don't miss this, dangerously hostile culture. Who are we? We are humble, blameless, and pure children of God, shining like stars, obediently holding forth the word of truth, the scriptures, truth that dispels Satan's darkness, and we're serving others as Jesus did. Well, I have another question. How, how do we respond to all of this? How are we then to live? And there is another command that follows in verse 14. God tells us through Paul, do everything without complaining or grumbling. That really hit me <laughs> because I've been grumbling and complaining a lot about what's been going on with this election and post-election. He says, do everything without complaining and grumbling. In other words, you know where you are. You're in enemy, enemy territory. You know who you are. You're my child. You're the children of God, shining like lights. You have the presence and the power of God, the Holy Spirit in you so that you can be enough be effective in doing what I have for you to do. So don't complain, he says. Just go get the job done. So, like Paul says in the next few verses, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. I didn't mention that Paul writes this letter to the church at Philippi in his fourth year of being in a Roman prison. He's waiting to hear Nero's decision whether he's going to live or die. And yet all through this letter, he speaks of joy. In fact, it's called the letter of joy. So my admonition to us is that we ought to be joyful as we shine like stars. Let's hold out the word of truth that changes people's lives and nations. You know, I've read the end of the book. God wins and Satan loses. So we need to be filled with joy. Let's pray. 
Father God, thank you that in the midst of difficult times, dr dramatically changed times, that we have this uh, the ba the balance and the the solid footing of your word on which to uh, respond and understand where we are, who we are, and what we're to do, and that you are with us to help us do it and do it well, and to protect us. And so, Father, I pray that we would be uh, humble, obedient servants. We would speak the truth in love, not adopt the tactics of the world and be combative and argumentative, but that we would walk before humanity, the pagan world around us, as examples of children of God so that they would see we have something they want and we would share it with them. Thank you for all of these truths in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week.